Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video presents the three tests of authentic Christianity. The Apostle John's first letter, near the end of the New Testament, gives us three tests of Christianity, as relevant today as when he first wrote them. But first, let me start by introducing a person important through most of my lifetime, the Reverend John Stott. He died in 2011. Here's a photograph of him. John Stott died, as I mentioned, 2011 at the age of 90. Those of us who are now seniors thought he would be around forever. He was always there, a strong leader of evangelicals around the world, an excellent Bible teacher and expositor, and a dedicated advocate for the stewardship of God's creation. Stott had a lifelong love for God's two books, nature and scripture. He expressed this both in his actions and in his words, for example, in his writings on the creation care of nature, as well as in his many scripture commentaries. The first of these commentaries that I read was Stott's commentary on the first John, the letters of John. In this small book, Stott explained that the Apostle John, in his first letter, 1 John chapters 1 to 5, laid down three tests of authentic Christianity. Here they are. Faithful obedience, compassionate love, and true belief. John's letters were written at the end of the first century of Christianity, when many heresies and divisions had come into the Christian church. People claimed to have new life, but didn't show the results. False teachers traveled around, expecting to be received into local Christian fellowships. Thus, the apostle lays out the basis of Christian fellowship in his first chapter before he gets into his three tests. The well-known statement, Christianity is Christ, is how the apostle John begins his letter. Here's verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Here, of course, the Apostle John is describing Jesus Christ, especially the risen Christ. After Jesus rose from the dead, he invited his disciples to touch his hands and his side so they could see it was really him. The Apostle John is probably reflecting back on this in this first verse. John then continues, quote, We proclaim to you the eternal life. Again, that's Christ Jesus. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us, so that you also may have fellowship with us. What John is saying here is this. Authentic Christian fellowship with other believers must involve a correct belief in the person of Christ who came from being with the Father to living on the earth as a true person, true man. Christ is the Son of God, the true eternal life. And Christian fellowship there is therefore is both horizontal with other believers and vertical with the persons of the Godhead. So the Apostle John continues, Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is still in chapter 1. Now if we are true believers, we walk in the light and not in darkness. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1. But some recipients of John's letter may not have been real believers. So John adds, quote, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. This is because God's very nature is light, and only people who are true believers walk in the light. The Apostle John then adds the basis of how we can walk in the light as true believers. When we confess our sins, they are all forgiven. Quote, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, purifies us from all sin. So this first chapter of John's first letter gives us the basis of our fellowship with God and the basis of our fellowship with each other. Now in the remaining four chapters of his first letter, the Apostle John then emphasizes three tests of authentic Christian fellowship. First, a story about William Tyndale. Back in the 16th century, William Tyndale played a key role in England in translating the Bible into the language of the English people. He also wrote a book called The Obedience of a Christian Man. Tyndale wanted people to know that just attending church by itself does not reflect the essence of being a Christian. Rather, God has established, in Tyndale's words, true duties 
for each individual Christian to obey beyond that of participating in religious ceremonies. Here's an engraving um, of William Tyndale back in the 16th century. So the first test that the Apostle John gives is also obedience. It's the moral test of obedience, to use John Stott's words. Quote, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. That's verse 3 of chapter 2. So people who openly disobey God, for example, in living immorally, can't be authentic Christians. That's what he's saying here. Then he actually calls them liars in verse 4 of the second chapter. Quote, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Now in scripture, disobedience, of course, doesn't just refer to sexual immorality, but that is one of the things, no doubt, that the Apostle John had in mind. But the test of obedience goes beyond just obeying explicit commands. If we have received new life in Christ, we will not only obey his word, verse 5, but we will live as Jesus did, verse 6. So a spirit of obedience, not just the letter of the law, is what the Apostle John is talking about. Now this focus on moral purity and obedience is emphasized again in the third chapter. Quote, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. That's chapter 3. So the reality of our conversion to Christ and confession of sin that we saw in chapter 1 will be shown by a changed life. Now the false Christians in the Apostle John's day were missing this. Now what's interesting is the moral test of obedience leads into the second test, which is the social test of love, again using John Stott's words. For the one new command that Jesus gave his disciples was to love one another as I have loved you. That's back in John's Gospel, chapter 13. A new command I give you, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. So John's letter builds on this in its second chapter. Quote, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. There's a second test. Again in the third chapter, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. And then again in the fourth chapter, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Now what's interesting is, in this fourth chapter of John, the, John's letter, the word love is mentioned 25 times in 15 verses of John's letter. God's great love for us should motivate us to love others. How can we do this? How can we put into practice the social test of love? John tells us, quote, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Now, there were lots of famines in the early Christian era. The first Christians took the collections and shared with those suffering in faraway places. You can see that in Acts chapter 11 and in 2 Corinthians 8. Likewise, today we can share with believers in need in other places through charities such as compassion, Food for the Hungry, Living Water, Samaritan's Purse, Tear Fund, and World Vision, just to mention a few. We can also just look around us where we live and look, think about the poor, recent immigrants, refugees, or those suffering tragedies. Now, this leads to a third test. The third test of authentic Christianity is the doctrinal test of belief, especially what we believe about Christ. John says, who is a liar? It is a man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Then the Apostle John says, Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. The false teachers in the Apostle John's day didn't fully believe in Christ. They were called Antichrist, in fact. Their teaching about Christ was so defective that they had to leave the fellowship of the Apostles. John wrote, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. John repeats this test in the fourth chapter, the test of belief. Every spirit who confesses Jesus Christ come in flesh is of God. That is, confesses that Jesus Christ was a true man. The person of Christ, his true humanity, as well as his full deity, is the touchstone of Christian belief and fellowship. Are there other essential Christian doctrines as well that we need to believe in to be a true Christian? Yes, indeed. 
I once took several days to go through the Bible, tabulating these Christian teachings that were taught or mentioned over a hundred times. But what's interesting is that Jesus taught some of these himself. If we believe in Jesus as the Lord, we will indeed believe in these. We'll believe, for example, that the Holy Spirit is a true person who lives amongst us, as Christ taught his disciples. We will believe that Jesus Christ is coming again, the second coming, as he also taught his disciples. So the key thing is to believe who Jesus is, fully God and fully man, and that he is Lord in our life. Now here's a summary. These three tests of authentic Christianity, the moral test of obedience, the social test of love, and the doctrinal test of belief are tightly woven together in the second, third, and fourth chapters of John's first letter. They can't be separated. So when we come to the last chapter, chapter five, he puts them all together in one paragraph. Quote, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. There's the doctrinal test of belief. And everyone who loves the father loves his child as well. There's the social test of love. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. There's the moral test of obedience. These three tests of authentic Christianity can't be separated. True conversion to Christ results in true Christian living. So let's not be fooled. If we don't pass all of these tests, we're in trouble. So this paper is largely based on John Stott's The Letters of John, although I'm not aware of any direct quotations. Thank you for listening.